Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and in this series we're looking at making a hand-painted blunderbuss or thunder gun game object. In this episode I'll be painting the wood parts. This will be a long video, I'm going into lots of depth and there's loads of detail in terms of texture painting in general so keep watching for loads of tips and tricks. Check the links in the description for more educational content such as this. I strongly recommend using a graphics tablet for this but you don't have to. Check out my buyer's guide for more details on that. Also there's a texture painting playlist so if you're having any difficulty with this then check out that playlist there's lots of answers in there as well. The reference image for this model and the model itself, unpainted that is, is available. Again follow the links in the description. Okay so here's where we got up to last time. I'm in the texture painting workspace and the first thing we need to do is select all our object, right click and shade smooth. It's currently on flat shading and smooth shading is what you need because we will be texturing or painting on all the highlights and all the crevices with light shades and dark shades. So the texture painting does all the work so you always have it in smooth shading. Now I'll select the piece of wood that we're going to paint at the bottom here and you can see it's shaded a little bit weirdly. It's quite shiny and odd looking so we can't paint on it like this. I'll bring out my shader editor slightly so you can see a bit more clearly what I'm going to do. If I hold down Control Shift and left click on my texture, you can see you get this nice flat shaded look. This texture has no influence from the lights whatsoever, so it's much easier to paint on because remember we're adding in with our painting the light influence. So all the lights and the shadows we're painting in, so this is how you want it set up. Now you need to have the Node Wrangler set up to do this, which I'll show you in a second, but it's going from an image node into the viewer node which is actually just an emission of one but that means it won't be affected by any lighting or shadows. So in order to be able to add that viewer node in quickly, you'll need to go up to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and then type in Node, and then make sure the Node Wrangler's ticked. Then you can close that screen down, and every time I hold Control Shift and then left click one of my nodes, it will change to that. So Control Shift, left click on the principal BSDF, and you can see we're back with the BSDF here. Now this can be useful because you can see the shadows and edges a bit more like this but if I press Control shift left click on my texture now it goes back to that flat shading which is what I need for my texture painting. So let's Control shift left click on the principal BSDF once again and that will switch across to that and I do do this when I'm texture painting sometimes just to see the edges so I can know where to highlight and where to put the crevices. One thing I like to do with my principal BSDF, as you can see it's a bit shiny at the moment, is just bring the roughness right up so it goes all nice and soft. I just find that a bit easier to work with than that really shiny outline. So in my shader editor I'll control shift left click on my image texture so that I'm all ready and set up for painting. I'll press control tab to bring up my menu and go to texture paint mode. Before painting just scroll down and double check you have got your bleed set to 16 pixels like I have here. That's for a 2048 pixel texture and it will ensure we get no seams. Also just above that we have symmetry so if we press on that drop down I can click the Y symmetry because we know we want it symmetrized across the Y. I do turn that off every now and again because you get a funny sort of seam down the middle but it's very useful to only have to paint on one side of the object. Those controls are also up the top here, if I middle click and drag across you can see it just there as well. For painting you'll probably want lots of reference images so I use PureRef and I drag and drop the images into PureRef and it keeps a copy of them and I can have this on my other screen whilst I'm painting. You can see I've got lots of designs here that I used as reference for the idea behind the blunderbuss as well. I'm thinking of this sort of wood here, perhaps Maybe it's sort of shiny quality I quite like, but I also quite like that sort of stylized look of some of those rougher looking woods over here. If you take a quick look at this one, this is a really lovely piece. And the way they've hand painted the textures, you can see that the light is coming from the top, so it's quite shaded underneath, but it's got these sort of highlights on the top. And that's the sort of shading and lighting and texture painting that we'll be doing today. So back into Blender and I'll be using the color palette down here so I'll be selecting colors and adding them to this. That way I can jump between the different wood objects that I'm painting and have the same palette between the two so they won't look different. I'm on the fill brush at the moment so I'm going to go across to the draw brush and I'll make sure I've got that color there by pressing S over the top of that. That will put it into my color picker. However, if I hover over the texture and press S and left click, that will put it into my color palette down here. You can see it's the same as the other one just here, so I can press this minus or negative button there and get rid of that. 
Now what I'm going to do to start off with is just put a base color down of wood. So I'm going to select lots of different browns and sort of reddy browns, yellowy browns, and then just paint strips across my object. So let's choose a slightly reddish brown and I'll change the tone so it's slightly lighter and add some variation there as well. And just paint a strip across my object like this. I think that's a bit big so I'll change the brush size with F. If you press F you can change the brush size and then I'll paint it across again. Control Z to undo of course. And just check that symmetry is on so make sure it's happening on the other side as well. Then I'll come across to my color palette and add that to my color palette and I'll choose a different color, maybe across the yellows a bit more, maybe a lighter tone as well, and put those strips in. Change the brush size with F, and you can see that's way too strong, so what I'm going to do is just bring the strength down a bit. Your strength is over here, and I'll bring it down to about 0.4, just so it's a little bit softer, there we go, and paint some strips across. Just watch out when you're painting at an angle, you can see it didn't go around the corner there, so just make sure that's filled in. It can be really rough at this point, we're just making sort of simple stripes at the moment. Try and keep them fairly uniform so they don't go off at a weird angle and just fill them in so they go around the corner. The reason I'm doing this is that wood has a grain so it goes and flows across one way so your colors kind of stripe that way very slightly. Okay, so I'll speed this bit up a little bit, just adding a few varieties of colors and sort of striping it across like this, each time adding it to my color palette with that plus button there. Remember to vary the size and tone as well, so the lightness and darkness of it. So there we have it, we've already got some okay-ish looking wood and it's a nice base for us to work on. Now I'm going to go across the smudge brush just here and then I'm going to very lightly just wobble this across my piece of wood and you'll see that it creates a sort of blend and smudges them together like so. Now because I'm using a graphics tablet and you can find out more about that with my Ultimate Buyer's Guide, that means I can use this button at the end here, which is pressure sensitivity. So I can draw very lightly and that will obviously change the strength. So you can see here, drawing across nice and lightly. So nice and gently. Your computer might lag if you've got your brush really big. I'm just trying to vary the direction of the grain slightly. This will help any parts that have gone weird and distorted around the corners. We can smudge those in nicely. Okay, so that's step number two, which is the smudging, and I'll just do that with the other one. So control tab, object mode, select my other one, control tab, text paint mode, and I'll just complete the other one as well. I feel like it's quite important to do them both at the same time like this. So at each stage, then go to the other one and do the same thing, and then go back to the first one. That way there won't be obvious differences between the two. You can actually just join them together and do this, but I find it easier to paint on an object that's completely isolated, then I don't accidentally brush one of the other ones and destroy my work. Remember to use the colors from the color palette so they are the same. So once you've got that base color down, then just use the smudge tool to wibbly wobbly it. And there they both are, looking fairly similar, and that's working nicely as wood. So I'm back to the first one and the next stage is to add in some shading. So ambient occlusion, where two objects meet, then you get ambient occlusion between the two, so you need to put some shading in. So back up to my paintbrush, and I can select a color from my object by just clicking on a dark spot and pressing S to sample it. I can then just go across to the tone and lower that slightly. But at this point, I don't want to paint that on my object just yet because I'd lose all the base color that I've put down already. If you see here, I'm painting over it and it's just painting that darker color in. But I actually want to keep some of that base color and just darken it so it keeps that variation in the wood but just has some shadow. So what we do instead is we use one of the blend modes here, the blend brushes, and its default is mix, and we go to the multiply. The multiply blend mode darkens colors, but it does keep their base color as well. The opposite to that is screen, which lightens colors, and it keeps their base colors also. These brushes here are all part of the darken group, and these brushes here are all part of the lighten group. But multiply and screen tend to be the best choices, which is all to do with how they kind of react with the color underneath. The other brush that's really useful is the Color Dodge. It's like a super screen brush, so it does it even more and tints the color slightly. Looks quite amazing, and I'll talk about that later. So select the Multiply brush, and then we can use that for our shading. This can be quite powerful, so uh, make sure you bring the strength down, and it does sort of build, so it will keep going all the way to black the more you brush on the object. And I'm just going to really lightly brush around these areas where I want some ambient occlusion. 
So like I say, where objects touch, that's where we get ambient occlusion, so we need to put in some shadows. And you can see it's keeping the base color, it's not just changing it all to one color, which is a dark color in this case, it's actually keeping those base colors and darkening them, which is what we want. And you can see the effects here. You want to, where you can, try and make it much darker in the very deep um, edges of the crevice so uh, there's more ambient occlusion the further you go in where these two objects meet. You need to try and keep it fairly clean you can see where the mirror meets there's a sort of slight line so you can turn the mirror off and you can use the blur brush which is like a gentle smudge and it will just blur it in together and gently bring the colors and tones together so you don't get such sharp lines if you use the blur brush. Now this area in here is a little bit awkward. I'll paint around here for now. I like to keep the other objects in so I can see where I need to put the ambient occlusion. But if I need to, I can isolate this object. You can do that by pressing forward slash on your numpad. So you can go in and you can isolate like this and easily go in and start painting. Ah, now there's a slight issue here. I can't seem to paint on these faces here. Now that's a really common problem and I want to talk about that for a moment. There's two possible reasons for this. If I go across into edit mode, so control tab and then edit mode, I can see my faces. The first thing to look out for is making sure there's no faces on top of each other. That doesn't seem to be a problem here. The other, if I go up to overlays and this drop down just here and face orientation, if I click on that, you can see anything that's red, I won't be able to paint on because that's the reverse of the object or the face, often known as reverse normal. So these two here, I need to select them both and press Shift N, which will recalculate the normals to make sure they're facing the right way. You can tick the inside button there as well if it, for some reason, doesn't flip the right way you want. Once you've made sure that everything's correct, click on the drop down again, face orientation, and you're back to normal. Back into texture paint mode, and now I should, hopefully, be able to paint on that area. And you can see that I can't paint on the back side of any of the other faces, which is helpful because I don't want it to bleed whilst I'm painting on this particular face up here. So you're safe, you can't paint on the backside or the inside faces of these faces. Okay, so forward slash to come out of isolation mode. I've painted in my shade and I'm ready now to paint in some highlights. So I can come across to my blend mode once again, click on the drop down and choose the screen this time. Now I can't just start painting on my object, not much comes out, it doesn't seem to be working. And that's because if we look at my color palette here, we've still got quite a dark color. And actually the screen and multiply brushes are affected by the color you choose as well as the tone you choose. So for screen brushes, you need a light tone. So the lightness and darkness slider on the side here. But it's also actually affected by the color. So this brown color will actually come across. If I pull this all the way to blue and start painting, you can see that the blue is actually influencing the colors underneath. So changing the color does make a big difference as well. So I'll undo that and I'll change it to a more sort of orangey sort of lighter color. A nice sort of orangey yellowy color will give it a fairly nice glow. So I'll use that. This got a nice sort of soft curvy shape. So I'll bring down the strength. If you want really sort of hard edges, you can use very sort of strong highlights. But in this case, I'm just using a soft edge. So I'll bring the strength down and my brush fairly big. So any sort of extremities, corners, or curved edges, we're trying to find them and highlight those. So just going around, giving it a soft glow on those edges. So once we've done that, we can go across to the other one and do exactly the same thing, just checking where the edges are and trying to highlight those with that screen brush. And fairly soft, not too much strength, you're just giving it a bit of a highlight as if it's worn and catching the light in those areas. And with the other one, I'll use the multiply brush to darken it. So you can do the shadows and the highlights in a different order, it doesn't matter too much. So remember to change the color for the multiply brush from the screen brush. And I used the brown last time, but actually what I tend to do is use an opposite uh, color, so a cool color, as opposed to a sort of nice warm color of the wood. So I'm going to sort of bring this up over towards the blues a bit more. It gets a bit complicated with color theory, but generally speaking, in your shadows you have a cooler color, and in your highlights you have a warmer color. Again, that's generally speaking. It looks like I'm just bringing it to the gray at the moment, but you actually kind of go across the middle here, rather than around the outside. It kind of makes sense, but it's for another video, complex color theory, which I'll probably do another time. 
So again, painting in some ambient occlusion around the edges where objects touch. I'll probably paint in a little bit of shadow on this one as well. So the underside, of course, is going to get a lot of shadow just here. Again, we're thinking about the lighting coming from the top. So a nice soft and quite big brush in this case because there's not too much tiny details to get into. So nice big brush, nice soft brush makes it fairly easy. I'll jump across the other one and I'll put some of those shadows in using that sort of bluer tone. It's a bit sort of purpley at the moment, but you get the idea and it's offering that sort of cool shade underneath. Okay, so you should be able to see it starting to sort of come together and looking a bit like wood now. The next bit is the fun bit and that's the detail. I like to put all the sort of crevicey bits in first. It's like you're sketching then, so I'll choose quite a dark color, usually picking one from the color palette, although you can just choose a dark one there and go a little bit darker still and then just start drawing my wood grain in. Remember to look at your reference images for this. I turn the strength of my brush up a bit as well uh, because this is gonna be a bit more sort of forceful and impactful to the piece. Be careful when you're painting around the corners like this as well. Try and find an angle to draw from where it doesn't sort of kink around the corner and just generally be careful when you are drawing corners and going around them because of that kinky problem. Now again, it's an advantage having a pen tablet here. If I draw a line across here for one of my wood grains, it's all very uniform. But if I press this button over here, that will also use my pen pressure for the size of the brush as well as the strength. So with both those buttons pressed, I can now vary the strength and vary the size across my wood grains. So I'll undo those and start working on some of these grains. Try and keep them fairly varied in terms of position and size. Now there's a funny area just here and it's got a sort of blend problem. Just use the smudge brush, make it nice and big, fairly soft, and just smudge over it and blend them into each other. Uh, that probably happens when you shade big areas. You sometimes get anomalies like that going around the corner, like I say. So I've sped the footage up five times now and I'll do a commentary over the top about what I'm doing. Be careful of the middle areas. You've still got symmetry on, so sometimes when you draw, if it's too close to one another, you'll kind of see that there's obvious symmetry. So I tend to leave the middle sections until later and then turn the symmetry off and go into the middle and start painting some more detail then. It's nice to do some interesting knots in the wood, like these sort of curly shapes like this. I'm not so sure about mine on this particular one, but I think I'll do some better ones a little bit later on the handle. So have a look at those for more detail. Now for these highlights, you want to sort of give the impression that there's a crevice there. So you add a highlight, or well, obviously a lighter brush, and you paint just on the underside of that crevice as if the light's coming down and catching the bottom. I'm going to use that highlight on these very edges of the wood here as well, just to highlight that curve that's going around. So again, got this lighter brush. What I should be using is the screen brush. I'm not sure why I chose to use an actual color here. Use the screen brush, it will preserve the colors underneath, which was a bit of a mistake by me. I kind of rectify it a little bit later on just by going in and adding some variation. I feel like the colors are a bit uniform, so and the areas are a bit blank in places, so I'm going in with a slightly different color, dark brush, and just adding a few pieces of wood grain, and now some little dinks and notches and things like that, blemishes in the wood, so darker colors, lighter colors, and just dabbing them around the place, scratches. You can even give the scratches a highlight, so make sure you give it a lighter color just underneath it, as if the light's coming down and catching it again and some of these sort of little dinks and things like that, I'm just giving a tiny highlight to, to make them stand out that little bit. It's just creating the illusion of depth all the time with highlights and crevices. Fairly straightforward, just using the multiply and screen brushes mainly. Now in the middle here, I can turn off mirror and then I can actually paint in sort of variation between the two sides like this. I had to cut a section out here because I had a weird problem where isolation mode or local view as I should call it wasn't working so forward slash on my numpad so I just went into object mode press shift H to hide everything but selected and I can go back in and alt H to unhide everything and start painting again not sure why that glitch happened or whether I'm doing something wrong but uh, yeah local view stopped working <laughs> On some of these blemishes, you can put a highlight underneath those as well. That makes them look like tiny dents, which I think can be quite effective. It does take time, this. This is sped up five times, so you can kind of see the amount of work that's going into it. I'm not particularly pleased with this one. I think the handle's a bit better when I start doing that a bit later on. 
I was thinking more about the explanation so it didn't come out quite as well and I needed to th be thinking artistically rather than teacherly. <laughs> so remember to jump between the two and uh, don't go too far with one before working on the other. For the handle I'm really concentrating on artistic style this time rather than any teaching so I kind of stopped thinking about that and just go for it here. And I'm really thinking more about the position of those uh, swirly bits so remember to turn the mirror off and then you can uh, make sure there's variation at the top particularly the top really because that will stand out much more than the bottom the bottom's in shade as well as being hidden so you don't have to worry too much about it make absolutely sure that you are double checking your symmetry you'll notice here that i haven't got symmetry turned on so i'm doing all these nice details on one side and forget to do them on the other what a classic I rectify it later on, but I'm leaving it in to remind you of those sort of issues you might have. You can see I'm going quite a long way without having any symmetry on, which is really irritating. You can also have a good laugh at my expense here. <laughs> so here I've switched across to the dodge brush, so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on with that. Really low strength, as you can see across to the side there, and it just offers a glow to objects. It's really, really good for metal, but it can also be good for things like wood as well, just to give them a bit of a sheen and I'm giving it a glow on the top where the sun hits it. It's really interesting how it works. It kind of changes the color really slightly or sort of uses the color and amplifies it. And yeah, like I say, it gives it a glow. So really nice brush to use. And you can see me using it here to get that shine on different parts of the object. I can't remember when I suddenly decide the other side hasn't been done properly. Yep, here we go, here it is. And I have to go in adding some texture. It can be quite useful because it adds variation to either side, but generally speaking, make sure that your mirror's on. <laughs> so I've sped it up to 1000% now because there's nothing really more to teach. It's just the process of kind of moving around, working on the image. This really is the stage that takes quite a lot of practice. You need sort of good artistic skills I suppose and observational skills looking at your references remember to have sort of real life references as well as just stylized references because stylization is based on reality so you need to have a kind of grasp of how to draw those things properly before stylizing that's not to say you shouldn't try and practice these things uh, without having a good grasp of the basics. I think it's always worth having a go. But if you are struggling, then do look back at the basics of how to draw wood in its general form without stylization. At this point, I felt it needed more variation, so I put in lots of minor sort of uh, grain and cracks and things like that. And I think that made a big difference, really. It just looks a bit more uh, realistic in some ways, or it adds kind of form to it anyway. The most important thing I think is to follow the steps. Don't try and go detailed too early on. Uh, follow those steps of getting a base color in there and then the shadows and then work on the details. Without the base color and the shadows, the details just don't work. So you've got to make sure the base is there first, then you can start having the fun doing these minor elements and filling them all in and creating something wonderful. You might find also that you don't really need to go to this detailed step to get something that looks quite good. This is well over the top for a game asset unless it was going to be a real focus, it was going to be zoomed in on a lot or something like that because generally speaking you're probably not going to see much of this detail. So unless it's used for something like cut screens or something like that uh, then you don't need to go this far. You can actually just use almost the base color and the shadows and that will do. Maybe just a tiny bit of detail here and there and you're probably fine. Also for these kind of details, a mouse is really, really tough and it will take you absolutely ages. A graphics tablet is so much faster and easier because of both the pen pressure and the coordination. So there we have it, the finished wood, as you can see there. Quite pleased with how this turned out. It's really good fun to do, apart from when I forgot to keep the mirror going. Lots of people have said they prefer this longer format, so I'm going for that, but it does mean you get slightly less in terms of when I release the videos. Well done to those that got this far, and thanks very much for all the support. Those that sign up to a Patreon, watch an advert, or donate, it's greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.